Parker Pedersen best from Out Stealing Horses, a Scandinavian novel that became a surprise bestseller in America a few years back before most of us had even ever heard of Stieg Larsson. I Curse the River of Time, recently published by Grey Wolf Press, is actually Pedersen's fourth novel that's available in English following Out Stealing Horses, To Siberia, and In the Wake. It is actually the first of um, these English translations that are come to us from Charlotte Barsland and in working in collaboration with Pedersen rather than Anne Bourne who translated the three other novels. It makes me a little curious about um, how that transition happened especially because I Curse the River of Time returns to a character that Pedersen wrote about in In the Wake. Now I had an interesting experience with this novel. First of all, the title, I Curse the River of Time, is so maudlin I would have been put off by it if I hadn't already developed a deep admiration and affection for Pedersen from reading Out Stealing Horses. Uh, the title I came to see actually uh, refers to a poem written by Chairman Mao of all people that Arvid, our protagonist, feels a, an a special connection to. He's, he's a devout communist in Norway and, um, for many years in the 70s and 80s, and he likes this poem by Mao in particular because he feels it reveals a certain kind of humanity in the man, you know, about Mao himself feeling the, the, the power of time's movement and a certain, you know, helplessness and awe before it and Arvid feeling some of these same things. And so he tries to connect with Mao in that way, though that connection, that human connection, as well as his connection to the Communist Party is often feels, well, rather thin. The novel takes place in mostly in November 1989, over just a few days. Arvid's marriage is dissolving. Uh, he has two daughters with his wife. His mother has just learned that she's been diagnosed with stomach cancer and has uh, quickly booked an overnight ferry to her native Denmark to retreat to um, a home that Arvid's family uh, spent many summers with growing up. And, of course, the Berlin Wall is coming down, which rings especially loudly given Arvid's own history. Arvid uh, quickly follows his mother uninvited to this house, showing up and spends an awkward few days trying to find points of connection with a woman who has loomed large in his life ever since he was a child, withholding an affection that he craves and... Arvid himself seemed, while well, he's 37 at the time of this novel, seems to seems to have a sense of not be not being willing to grow up until he's um, until he gets what he's been looking for. Now, Arvid is a uh, he's a tough character to like, given that he's like in the midst of these profound shifts, and he's and the novel whole novel sits in the points of these shifts with when you don't when you can't see at all what's coming on the other end of divorce, on the other end of death, on the other end of um, communism in Europe, Arvid is, you know, returning to, you know, this deep nostalgia as a, as a way of coping. Now, this nostalgia is completely understandable, and as he recounts the how he had, uh, his relationship with his mother, how he had left college to work in a factory as a way of manifesting his communism, communist beliefs, you know, caused a deep rift in his relationship, uh, especially with his mother, who had worked in factories to send him to college. Much of the most beautiful moments and most striking moments of the novel are there. I mean, you can feel Arvid's just beating heart through, through these pages. It's just, um, it's hard not to feel a certain um, affection, affinity, and share his sorrow with him. But at the same time, he he is childish, as his um, soon-to-be ex-wife calls him early in the novel in a section that won me immediately over. And while sometimes some of these childish acts of connection and trying to be the person he imagines himself being are humorous, even hysterical. Arvid's recounting of them doesn't fully recognize the humor in it, and it's in um, even the comic moments are instead overcome with gloom. And so this somber novel was difficult for me to read sometimes just because I got so impatient with Arvid. I wanted him to just stop complaining, stop nursing his wounds, stop sinking into this nostalgia. He's almost painfully oblivious sometimes over what she's going through because he's so you know, trying so hard to create meaning for himself, you know, out 
out of uh, that relationship and her role in his life. Now, I say this by um, noting that even um, Arvid's mother, you know, suffering from cancer and struggling with a son that she doesn't have a very deep connection to is not a particularly sympathetic character either. And I give a lot of Pedersen a lot of credit with this, that he's able to sustain a novel um, that is, uh, that features characters that are often hard to like and that sits still in moments of so much change and very truthfully revealing how we, in those kinds of moments, we often get fixated on these strange and small and surprising things to help us navigate it. It's amazing that the center holds in this book. It is a beautifully cut diamond of a novel. You know, it's a slim book that feels more than the sum of its parts. At the same time, I did struggle with that Arvid. I did. I had to step away from it sometimes, the way I need to step away from people who simply complain too much or whine too much. Well, I think there, there is opportunity to uh, balance that that readerly frustration with Arvid by bringing in some texture and maybe expanding those comic moments more, like when he gives an ill-fated, drunken toast to his mother on his 50th birthday, or her 50th birthday. That doesn't happen, and I don't think that texture is um, fully created, and therefore there aren't that as many points of relief for a reader who just can't take too much of that whining. Still, I have to say, I Curse the River Time is a very good book. Well, I think some might recommend swallowing it whole, reading this short novel in one sitting. I am one who will advocate re taking it in in small sips and experiencing it with a, the same kind of patience and slowness that the text itself celebrates.